guys, how's it going? It's Jay, and what I got for you today is the Sony FX30 Beginner's Guide. So this is what you get when you take all the hardware out of the box. You get a battery, you get a charging you know, port here. This you just plug into a power strip, and then you have to plug the USB cable into this, like so, here would go into the actual camera on the USB-C port to charge. Let's just throw the battery in really quick, I'll show you. If you look here on the bottom, you got this little door, you can just swivel that open, it's got that little lock lever there. All right, so to put the battery in, we basically just turn it this way, and it's gonna slide in like so. See that? And notice this little blue lever, that's the lock lever that holds it. So again, if you just swivel this little lever, that will pop the battery out, and then you can take it out like so. And you see there's like a spring in there that pushes the battery up. So that's how that works. Then when we close the door, we have to slide this little lever over to lock it. So now that the battery's in, we can get charging it. And that's really the first thing you're gonna wanna do when you get this camera. You really need to charge that battery up. So if you notice here, we got a bunch of doors on the side. I'll go over this in more detail in a second. I just wanna show you how to get this thing charged as quick as possible. See that port there? That's the USB-C port, and that is where you are going to plug in the charging cable. So that would literally plug in right here, like so, and then you can plug this into the wall. So I have a thing right here, a little power cord, so I can plug that in, and now you can see there's a yellow light lit right there. That'll tell you that the battery is charging. Once that light goes out, the battery will be fully charged. All right, guys, so now that the battery is charging, I assume you have it plugged in and you're still watching along here. So first of all, congratulations, awesome camera. You got one of the best crop factor video cameras on the market today, in my opinion, especially because it's Sony. You have so many lenses to choose from when it comes to Sony, and this camera is a absolute workhorse. It's a cinema line camera. So it has that special finish on it and it's not gonna overheat, it's weather sealed. Like this is like a really, really hardcore camera. You might have seen my FX3 video. This is basically the same exact camera. It just has a smaller crop factor sensor in there and it cost about half as much. So Sony cut the price in half and they made the sensor a little bit smaller. But what that did was for, you know, around $1,800, $2,000 approximately, they gave you access to a video camera that is unbelievably awesome. Let's just go over the camera body itself. Now notice how you have the quarter 20 threads. They are black instead of silver on the FX3. So that is a little bit different, but otherwise the body's pretty much identical as far as I could tell. A couple of things are black though, instead of silver, you know? So that's what we're looking at. Now, there is an XLR handle that I did not get with the FX30, only because it was just back ordered. But as you can see here on the FX3, I'll show you from that video, this is what the XLR handle looks like, and it actually bolts into these screws right here on the top of the camera. And you can see now, when the handle is mounted, um, just how secure it is, and you know, just how you can now hold the camera from the handle and all that. And it basically just slides into this hot shoe. So this plastic cover comes off, and that's where the XLR handle slides in. Now, also looking at the top of the camera, we have a bunch of cool uh, stuff here. We got the record button that actually lights up, by the way, when you hit record. You have this navigation toggle to move around the menu and move your focus point, for example. And it also acts as a button if you click it. You have custom button one, two, and three here, which are default set to iris, white balance, and ISO or ISO. This little icon here shows you where the sensor plane is. So if you need to measure for macro photography, for example, you would measure from that line right there. So you also have stereo mic ports here if you're not using the XLR handle, for example, and you want some audio. Now also looking at it from the top, we have the shutter button here, which is like a two-stage button. So when you press it lightly, it'll focus. If you press it all the way, it'll take the photo. And this is actually a zoom in and out lever. Uh, this is great for power zoom lenses, which will actually zoom in and out with a power assisted motor inside the lens. But most lenses are not power zoom lenses, just so you are aware. But you can still use this zoom lever for clear image zoom, which is a really high quality digital zoom. Um, so it's not like a useless lever, even if you don't have a power zoom lens. Notice here there's like a translucent notch. That is actually a tally light. So when you hit the record button, that will light up red to let you know you're recording. 
And there's also another one on the back here, this gray looking bar is also a tally light that will light up when recording. So these two loops here are for your neck strap. If you wanna put a neck strap on or a wrist strap or something like that, that's what these are for. Now looking at the front of the camera you have here, this is your lens release button. So there's a lock pin in there. And uh, if you press this button, you can see this little pin here move. And that's what locks the lens on and off. Now here you have your lens pins. So that's how the lens communicates with the camera. And of course you have your APS-C sensor in there, which is five axis stabilized as well. Now this body cap, just while I'm here, there's a white dot there. The body cap has a little notch on it. You just line that up to the white dot and that's how you would put that on. Same thing with a lens. Lenses will have a white dot as well. You need to line that up. Now, looking at it again from the front here, you have another custom button, number six. By default, that's a record button, which is quite nice if you're in front of the camera. You can just reach out and hit that button very easily. You also have the AF illuminator here. This will light up to help focus in low light conditions. Now, looking at it from the back, we have a bunch more buttons. Now, this is actually the on and off button here. And it's a really cool design. It's got like a slide lever and it has like a protection on this side so you, you won't accidentally slide it off. You can see how it's notched there. If you look at it from the top, you see how it has that little notch? So it's, it'll just make it a little bit harder to turn off accidentally. Now there's no mode dial on the top of the camera or exposure comp dial. So you actually have a mode button here. So I'll show you that when we turn the camera on. Then we have a menu button, of course. I like how the menu button is on the right side so you can hit it while using just one hand. When the menu button's over here, you can't quite reach it with your thumb and you need to bring in another hand. You know, just a little feedback there that I noticed. I really like this thumb rest here. The ergonomics are pretty darn good on this ultra compact cinema grade camera. Now you also have a dial here that you can turn and that's recessed quite a bit, so you're not gonna accidentally turn that. You have to kind of press your finger into it a little bit to get access to it. You can see how it's kind of like close to the edge there, um, so it's not sticking out that much, so it takes a little bit of effort to get it, but the feedback feels really good on the dial. Now you also have more custom buttons here. You got five, you have a function menu button, which I'll show you in a minute when we turn the camera on. Custom four is also the garbage can. You also have a playback button here. You can turn this dial, so this dial acts as a wheel, and it also acts as a four-way button. So you can press in all directions. If you go up, that'll be display. If you go to the right, that'll be peaking by default. Then also, if you press on this button, like that, that's the enter button. So when you're in the menu and you have to select something or whatever, just press on the center button there and that is like your enter button or select button. Now, you also have this really nice LCD screen here that opens up as you can see here. And it also rotates. So you got a nice rotation there. So this would be selfie mode if you had the camera facing towards you like so, that'd be selfie mode. Then of course you can rotate the screen so you can have it like this, so if you have the camera really low to the ground, you can have the screen aiming up, or you can rotate it and use it like this if you want, or you can rotate it all the way like that, and now the camera, if you have it like over your head, you can look at look up and look at the screen, which is a, just a nice feature. Also, when vertical shooting, which a lot of people are doing these days for Instagram and things like that, you can hold the camera like this, and you can see the screen, and it's very easy to frame your vertical perspective when you use the camera like this. You can hold it from the grip and then make sure you have your framing correct for vertical shooting. And again, you could do the same thing. You can hold it this way and have it over your head doing vertical shooting as well. And it's very easy to make sure that, you know, your verticals are vertical and so forth. Now also note, you can put the camera screen in armor mode. So when you're stowing the camera, highly recommend putting it this way so you don't scratch the screen. And you have this nice notch here to grab the screen like so. And then of course you can close the screen this way and have the screen you know, out, which is how we're gonna be using it in the lab scene in a, in a moment. All right, so looking at it from the side here, I already showed you where you charge it. So we'll just start there, but you also have a micro USB port there. So it's not just a USB-C, it's also a micro USB, which is handy for some other features if you wanna use those. Now you also have a microphone and a headphone jack there. And these doors are really nice. They're very stiff and rigid doors and they close with like a nice little lock. And underneath here you have a HDMI type A, so a full size HDMI port 
which is really nice, especially uh, for those hardcore video users. The micro HDMIs are not near as good and they tend to come loose and stuff. So full size HDMI is really welcomed. Now over here, you have the heat sink vent. So this has active cooling inside the camera. So if you look at it from the bottom, you have a input here. So this is where the air would go in and then it comes out on the side over here to help cool the sensor. Now also on the bottom here, you have your tripod mount right there. I wanna show you the memory card slots. So to get to those, they're like part of the grip here. So you just gotta slide this down and then push out and that will open the door. So here, what we have is dual CF Express type A slots that are also dual SD slots. So they're like dual purpose slots. Now the CF Express type A cards uh, are really fast. They're faster than SD cards, but they're astronomically priced in my opinion. They're so expensive, they're just not worth it. But you know, depending on your work case and your budget, they might be worth it for you if you need fast turnaround times and you can budget that into your project or whatever. So I got these pro grade cards here and they were on sale the other day for Black Friday. So I picked up two of them. They're really good cards and that's what I mostly have been using. So they actually go in this way, like so. And the other card that I really like to use is the SanDisk here. And this is one I've been using for at least a year now, no problems whatsoever. The ProGrade cards are just a little bit cheaper, but this is also an excellent option. And I'm gonna put that into slot two, like so. So now I have the camera set up using both slots. So when we get into the menu, I'll show you how you can set this up for redundancy. So if one card were to fail, like in a professional environment, I highly recommend using the camera that way. So like I said, if one card fails, you'll still have your video and photos on the other card. You can also set it up to it as an overflow. So if you're not doing pro work and you just want more capacity, you can have two cards and when the first card fills up, it'll flow over and start filling up the second card. Or you can just have photos and videos on separate cards if you want it as well. So a lot of options there. I'm just gonna close that like so. All right, so let's just mount up a lens here. Let me show you how to do that in case you've never done that before. Again, looking at the front, I'm just gonna unscrew the body cap. And what I got here is I have my Sony 20 millimeter f1.8 lens. And again, if you look, see this white dot? That white dot is gonna line up to that white dot right there. So let's line those up as you can see here. See the white dots? And then we just twist and it locks into place. And that lock is that lock pin that I showed you before right here. That's that lock pin clicking on the lens. So once the lens is locked on, it will not come off. You can't get it off uh, without hitting that button on the bottom here to release it. So yeah, you have to hit this button and then you can twist the lens off. So that's pretty much how that works. Let's take the uh, lens cap off. And this particular lens has an aperture ring on it. So if you wanna use that, you can. Otherwise, make sure you have that set to the A option and then you can control the aperture on the camera. This is a zoom lens. It's the 16 to 35, another really good option. But to zoom it, you would have to actually turn the zoom ring. So you remember how it's telling you how the FX3 has that power zoom lever on there, but this is not a power zoom lens. So if you have a lens like this, you have to actually turn it. Uh, it won't work with the power zoom lever. So again, here on this lens, let's take that lens hood off. This is the focus ring and it's nice and buttery smooth and the aperture ring. And then you have a button on the side that you can custom configure and then you have an autofocus manual focus switch. Um, different lenses will have different features. Some lenses will have an optical stabilization switch as well. So this is just a more complicated lens basically, just so you're aware. So on the side here, you're gonna have features that you may or may not wanna use. All right guys, so let me just turn this on. And this is what you're presented with when you first turn the camera on. So I'm gonna select English and I'm gonna go with that option there. And today is January 5th, as it turns out, here in New York, 2022, and we're looking at 9.15 a.m. So I gotta go to the other nine. And I just hit this button here for okay. Remember that center button there? This is awesome. This is normally a feature you have to go into the menu and change. So it's just telling you right out of the gate. Yeah, set that now, 100%. Click okay, we're good to go. All right, so now this is telling you about the Imaging Edge mobile app. I have a bunch of videos on that if you guys wanna learn how to use that app. And uh, it's just telling you basically how you gotta register and stuff like that. It's gonna click okay. 
So I'm gonna leave it as FX30, but if you were to buy multiple of these, for example, you can have it FX30-123, whatever the case may be, or put a dash in somebody's initials, you know, for somebody on your team, as an example. Bluetooth pairing. I'm just gonna cancel that. Now it's saying perform pixel mapping optimizes the image sensor. So yeah, do that. It's saying to attach the lens cap, but it doesn't, I'm pointing at the desk, so it's black, it's good. I'm gonna click okay. It wants the screen to be all black when it does the pixel mapping. So make sure you put the lens cap on or you have it pointed down at a desk or something like I'm doing right now. All right, pixel mapping complete. Okay. All right, so now we have the camera basically right out of the box pretty much set up. So I got this plate here from my Manfrotto tripod. So I'm just gonna mount that to the bottom. So it just screws in. You see the screw? All I gotta do is screw that in right there. This is a really big plate, which is nice, gives it really good support. So I'm just going to screw that on, clamp it down there like so. There we have it. All right, so I'm going to mount that to the tripod. All right, so I highly recommend investing in a good tripod. Now, I just invested in this. This is brand new. I haven't even taken it outside yet, but it's the 190. It was on sale. And this is an unbelievably good deal from Manfrotto. They have a newer model out there, but like I said, this is a little older, but it was on sale. So uh, it's carbon fiber. It's got, you know, three sections. It's not the most compact tripod, but it's really high quality. And I gotta say, I am so impressed with this tripod. I actually got this ball head for it as well. So I got a new ball head and it has this nice little drag option. So you can actually have tension on the top, which is really nice. So this is the tripod that I'm gonna use. And like I said, I highly recommend investing in a good tripod. Um, you wanna take professional video, you're really gonna need a good tripod. And then of course, the top here is where the camera is gonna mount. That's where that plate is gonna go. So let me, let's me let set this thing up in the lab and I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right guys, so here is the top of the tripod. And here's looking at the bottom of the FX30 with the tripod plate. And it's just gonna slip in here like so kind of just notch in the front part and the back part locks in. So now you can see it's like, it's loose, but it's locked on, it can't fall off. To take it off, you press this lever here and now I can take the camera off. So once it locks into place, you just need to tighten it up like so. Now the camera's nice and tight on top of the tripod. You don't have to worry about any camera shake or anything like that. All right guys, so when you turn the camera on right out of the box, this is what it looks like. So it puts it into movie mode right there and that's what that stands for flexible movie mode now i just touched the screen which enabled touch focus that's what that little box is there you can cancel that by hitting this button here or pressing right there and that'll cancel the touch tracking that was there by default like i said i touched the screen by accident and if you hit this display button here you can change the way that this screen looks you can bring up the histogram the auto leveler thing and so forth so that's pretty much what you're looking at there now if you are brand new to this camera though this mode is going to be a little bit too hard for you to use in my opinion so i would recommend going into the mode dial here and switching the camera into this full auto mode now again this is if you're brand new and you want to get out there and start using the camera immediately if you don't know how to use it put it in auto mode like that now you could see the camera screen looks much better. It looks like a proper exposure and stuff because the camera's doing all the thinking for you. So this is a photography mode, but you can record video with it as well. So watch what happens if I press the shutter button. It's focusing and notice how it's focusing on the face in the center of the scene there. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see a little better. See, it's focusing on the eye of the face, which is absolutely remarkable, but you could just touch wherever you want. Like I could touch on the dollar bill and it'll focus there. Or I could cancel that and now it's just gonna default back to focusing on the face. So facial recognition is on by default and that's why it's focusing on the face. And if I hit the display button here, it'll change the way the screen looks, like just giving you more information around the screen there. So this is the one with all the information. Now notice here you can see where the facial recognition is on so now if I want to record video, I can just hit the record button. And now the camera's recording video. And notice that rectangle that came up on the screen to let you know you're recording. In addition, you have a tally light here. There's another tally light on the front of the camera. And the record light itself is also lit up. 
So all those indicators are letting you know that it's recording. And now you can actually change the focus while recording video if you want as well. So I can touch around the screen. All right, so now if I touch over here, it's gonna focus on the background. It was just a little too dark before. So now watch what happens when I cancel tracking. It's gonna go right back to the face because face pr facial priority is on. When you turn facial priority off, it will just focus on whatever is closest to the camera by default. So if I stop pressing record, so that's how you would use full auto. If you wanna take a photo, you can just press, it'll focus and take the shot. If you want it to focus somewhere in particular, you can just touch to that area, that will change the focus. And then you can cancel the touch again by hitting that button or hitting this center button here. And that is just basic operation of how you use the camera. Now let's go into the menu here and I'll show you some more stuff and then we'll come back out and I'll show you some of the more advanced modes. So if we go into the menu here, I just wanna show you what it looks like when in full auto mode. If you look on the left hand side, you could see these are all the different menu options. So we have setup, we have network, playback, focus, exposure, color, and then we have main one, and then we have my menu setting. So my menu, you can go in there and you can program this with all the stuff that you use most, and you can easily access it in the my menu area. Now main one, this is a new feature that Sony introduced, which I really like. I hope they adopt this to all the new cameras. Because I'm in full auto, it's only one page, but when I switch this to the more advanced modes, there'll actually be two main pages. But if you go over to the right here, this gives you access to some of the stuff that um, you might wanna change when using full auto. For example, if you wanna shoot in JPEG mode, you can change that here. I don't like using JPEG mode, I shoot in raw quality. JPEG, the camera will do all the processing for you and you have a pretty much ready image to share on social media or whatever. Raw quality, you have to edit in a program like Lightroom, for example, so you have to process the raw files and then save them as a JPEG if you want to you know, go out and uh, share them on social media, for example. So now I have the quality set to raw. Now, if you go over here to record media settings, check that out. This is where you can configure what the memory cards are doing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this and I'm gonna do simultaneous recording. And I'm gonna do simultaneous recording. So this is where you're gonna want it. So now I'm gonna simultaneously record the photos to both memory cards and I'm gonna simultaneously record video to both memory cards. So that's how you would want it set up for redundancy for professional work. Uh, so I highly recommend setting it up that way. But again, you can set it up a number of ways, as you can see here, uh, depending on what you want to do. So another option here, you have drive mode. So if you click on that box, this is where you can change your drive mode. Now it's a little bit hard to see because of the lab scene in the background. But over here on the left, you have a couple of options. You have self timer. So if you want to set the camera to self timer, you can go left and right on the directional pad here and change the amount of time. So you can do 10 seconds, you can do five seconds, or you can do two seconds. All right, I guess that was five seconds, sorry. <laughs> but anyways, you see how it counted down? That's how that works. Now you can also get to that by hitting the function menu, this FN button here. So if I hit the FN button, notice how on the bottom, this little sub menu pops up. Now there's not many options in here because again, I'm using full auto mode, but you do have the self timer, see that? So I can change that drive mode right here, like so. So now it's back to single shot mode. And if I hit the function button again, you can go in here and this is where you can change the focus mode. Now, right now it's set to autofocus automatic. So basically what that means is it'll switch between continuous autofocus, which is what you would use for moving objects like sports and stuff, and single focus, which is what you would generally use if you wanna focus and then you could reframe the shot and take the photo, but the focus won't change. It's like once you establish the focus, it's locked when you're using AFS mode. In AFC mode, it's constantly focusing when you have the shutter pressed down. Again, great for moving subjects. So AFA will automatically switch between those two modes. So it's just like the smarter version. So it'll switch between AFS and AFC depending on what the camera sees you're, you're doing, you know? If it sees moving subjects, it's gonna switch it to AFC mode. Now here we have direct manual focus and manual focus. So this is what you would set the camera to 
if you want to manipulate the focus manually, as you can see here, just by turning the focus ring. Direct manual focus will actually work in autofocus, but then once the focus locks, you can actually change the focus and dial it in, like so. So the focus is locked, but I'm actually manually focusing it after it and you could take the photo. So why you would want to use DMF, for example, is if you're doing like macro photography or something and you take you focus automatically, but it focused on the wrong part of the flower, you could then just focus it and then dial it in to exactly where you need it. So that's a really cool feature for more advanced manual focusing, but with autofocus assist kind of. That's how I like to think about it. I'm just going to leave that on AFA. Now, in addition to that, we got a couple other settings here, peaking, steady shot. Peaking is a more advanced mode where it'll show you, it'll highlight where the contrast is and it's helpful if using manual focus. Steady shot here, this is where you can go and turn that on and off. I'm just gonna leave it on for now, but I'm on a tripod so I don't need it on. Image quality, this is where you can go and set that up. I already showed you this from the other menu, but I just wanted to make you aware that that's how it works in the function menu. Now to go into the playback menu, if you wanna see the photos that you actually took, you can hit this button down here and that'll bring you into the playback menu. And this is where you can, you know, check out all the different photos. And you could use the zoom lever on the top of the camera to zoom in and out, which is really convenient. So you can check your focus really easily and you could zoom all the way out to this like calendar view as you can see here, and then you can scroll through the different days if you wanted to. You can also go over here to the left and you could limit it to just photos or just video if you're looking for a certain, you know, clip, for example. So that's pretty much how that works. Let me switch to a movie here. So here's a video. So if I just tap, it'll start playing. And there we go. You can just tap to stop it if you want and so forth. So that's pretty much how playback works. It's pretty straightforward. So let me go back into the menu here and I just want to show you how the menu changes depending on what mode you're in. So what I'm going to do now, notice again how there's just main there, main one, and then again the function menu, how it's a lot very limited here. So let me change the mode. Let's go into a more advanced mode. So let's say we want to use aperture priority mode for example. We'll select that and now when I go into the menu we still only have main one but if I go into the function menu, you can see now we have a lot more options in here. So now I have the ability to change the metering. That's what this is. The uh, metering mode is how the camera decides to expose for the scene. So right now it's basically using the whole scene. But if I go to center area, it's only going to use the center area of the scene. And then here we have spot mode and you can change the size of that and that will limit the exposure to just that area that the spot is, which is the center of the screen by default. And now this is the entire screen average and highlight metering. Highlight metering is awesome because it looks for the brightest stuff in the scene and exposes for that. So this is great if you're exposing for the lights or like a really bright object, like a white wedding dress or something like that, or white frothy water, for example. So that's what the metering modes do. And here we have the ISO, that's the sensor sensitivity. So you can dial that in as needed. We'll talk more about that when we get into the more advanced modes. And this is your exposure compensation. So you can basically swing the exposure one way or the other, depending on what you're trying to do. So if you want the exposure to be underexposed a little bit, you can do that, or you can overexpose a little bit. Again, depending on what you're doing, a lot of times you might need to do that. If shooting in snow, for example, you're going to want to overexpose quite a bit because the snow throws the camera metering system off. So you have the power for the exposure compensation in this particular mode, aperture priority. Now you have focus area. Focus area is basically what it does is it limits the focus to a specific part of the screen. So right now I'm using the entire screen and that's what wide stands for, but you can lock that down by switching it to zone. So zone, you could see now there's these four little brackets and you could move them around. And so now the camera will not focus outside of that rectangle. All right, so let me go back in there and change it to a different one. So we got center 
focus. So now you can see there's just that little rectangle in the center of the screen. And if I go in here, I can go to spot focus, and then we have expand flexible spot. I like expand flexible spot, it works really well. So you can use this toggle on the top of the camera to move it around, or you can just touch, whichever is easier. But when you touch, it's gonna to default to touch tracking, just so you're aware how the camera is set up by default. So I'm just gonna cancel that by hitting that button, or you can hit this center button to cancel it, remember? And I'm just gonna use the joystick. So let's say I wanna focus on the dollar bill right here. Now the focus is limited to that tiny little area. It can't focus on anything but what's in that little box. So it works really good for precision focus. So let's say I wanna focus on the quarter. Right there, it's locked onto the quarter. Now I can go right here and I can focus on the background. By the way, if you push on this button, if you push down, it'll automatically put it back into the center. So if I focus here, it's gonna focus on the background now, see? All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put the ISO into auto mode. So if I go into the function menu and I go over to ISO, I'm just gonna go up here and put it in auto. So now it's in auto ISO. So let me hit record. And now it's recording video at the current camera settings at our default. You can see on the top what the camera is currently set to. We'll change that in a minute, but I just wanted to show you how the focus works when recording video. So again, notice this focus area. If I move it over here, if I just touch over to the dollar bill, now it's gonna focus on the dollar bill. And if I touch over there, it's gonna focus back on the background. And you can change the speed at which it focus transitions. So you can make that transition slower or faster, just so you're aware. Right now it's set to default. It's gonna turn that off. So now if I go into mode, let's switch the camera back into where it was out of the box. So movie mode. Now we're back in movie mode. And if I hit the menu button, notice now how we have two main options. We got main one and main two. So this is awesome because these are the features that most likely you're gonna be changing the most if using the FX30. So main one gives you all the different options here for video that you kind of need. So for example, if I were to be using this, what I always shoot at is 4K quality for the most part. So let me go up here. I'm just gonna select 4K. So you can select that option there. And then we can go over here and you can select the uh, bit rate. So I want 10 bit. So I'm gonna select that option there, 10 bit. Now it's currently set to PP11, which is S Cinetone, which is like a turnkey picture profile. It looks really nice. Highly recommend trying PP11 for now, but you can turn this picture profile off or you can change it to a different picture profile. So I'm just gonna turn the picture profile off for now. So what I wanna do now is just change my frame rate here to 24P like so. Because I just changed the frame rate, now the bit rate changed. So I gotta go back down here and change that. That's the reason why I did it in that order. So you can see how sometimes other settings will change. So now what I want is the 10 bit option here, 10 bit 422. So now we're back to shooting 10 bit quality, which is the best quality and 4K. Now you have proxy recording here. So that's very convenient if you need to do proxy recording. Wind noise reduction. That's set to auto, I'm gonna turn that off. I don't want that. And now you have microphone record level, so you can see it moving as I'm talking. Now on the FX30 and the FX3, since they updated the firmware, they kind of separated the picture profiles and the log stuff. The log stuff used to be in picture profiles. And if you go over to picture profile, you could see when you scroll down, they got rid of a bunch of the numbers. It goes from P6 and it skips right to P10 now. So P10, P11, by the way, is S Cinetone. And then here you can import your own LUT. If you go to main two, so if I just go down to main two, this is where you can turn log on. So check this out. It's gonna turn log, and then these are the different options for log shooting. So flexible ISO is very similar to shooting how you would normally shoot in photography mode. So, but notice below that, here is the log. So now the camera is set to S log. And it's also going to embed the LUT file. So if you are using a LUT, it'll put that into the EXIF data so you can see what LUT was being used when you were filming. But it won't actually change the log footage. It'll just give you that look while you're recording. 
just so you're aware, the log footage will still be flat and you'll need to apply the LUT in post-processing. So now if I just go back to menu and now I'm in flexible video mode here and you can see how I have this option. See how there's an option there? This is where you can change the shutter speed to auto. So you can basically put this into auto, put this into auto, put this into auto, and now the camera is basically in full auto mode using log. So if you don't want to control any of the settings, the camera will do it for you. And that's just one cool thing that you can do in flexible mode. Now you can also do this in the flexible mode without log. So if I turn log off, if I go in here, go back to flexible ISO and shut that off and go back up to main one, notice how I still have these options here to turn it to auto. So I can, it's set to manual now, but I could change that to auto. And then that would put the camera basically in aperture priority mode, shutter priority mode, or full auto if you have them all set to auto. And you can see there's one for ISO, one for shutter speed, and one for aperture. So again, if I scroll down, let me just show you the other option here for log, the Cine EI menu. But this is where it is if you want to enable it. And it's pretty cool. This is where S-Log 3 is, but you can go in here and you can change that if you want. I like this dot .cine version. And then if you go back to the menu here, notice how it says base ISO. So the camera has two base ISOs. So you have ISO 800 and ISO 2500. Those are the two base ISOs for the FX30. So when you're using Cine EI mode, you can't change the ISO. It's locked at whatever the base you have selected. So all you can really change is the shutter speed and the aperture, but it is still giving you the ability to set that to auto, which is pretty cool, even in an advanced mode like Cine EI mode. So that's just a quick, very, very quick overview of how this works if you wanna shoot in log and Cine EI or flexible. And Cine AI Quick is very similar, it's just less options. So that's how you would go about uh, shooting log if you wanted to shoot log. Now if you scroll over here, you have your memory card options. So you can go in there and format the cards. Recording media, this is where you can control how you have them configured. I have it set to simultaneous, showed you that a minute ago. Now here, steady shot, you have set to standard, exposure mode, can't change that. File settings. This is where you can go and change the file name of your files. I highly recommend doing that because if you go in here, you can go to title settings and you can change that. So I'm going to change this to FX30 like that, FX30 underscore. And then what it'll do is it'll put the sequential numbers after the underscore and that's what it'll look like, FX30. I'm just going to switch this to title, like so. And now you can see FX30 underscore 1234. So that'll sequentially count as you take uh, photos and videos and stuff. I'm just going to click Menu here. Now down here, again, we have Autofocus Continuous. So it's going to be continuously focusing when you're recording video by default. But you can switch that to Manual Focus for the more advanced sh shooters out there. Now. Autofocus for facial, you can turn that on and off here. So if I turn that off and then I try focusing, let me just put this, let me change my focus area here. Put it back to wide. And now you notice, see how it's not focusing on the face? It's just focusing on whatever's closest to the camera. So you can see all the different focus squares coming up, but not the eye icon. That's because I have that facial turned off. If I go back into the menu here, Turn that back on, and now focus. You see how it's focusing on just the eye? That's the difference there. That's what facial recognition does. And this is awesome for recording video. It just tracks the human eye. And if you don't want it to tr get stuck on the faces, you can just turn it off. Now, if you go in here, this is where you can change your subject. So I have it set to human, but of course you can select animal and bird there as well. So those are the two new modes pretty much in the menu here and it's so awesome because all the key settings that you need for video and stuff you can change right in these first two menus so the more advanced stuff is going to be 
you know, deeper down in the menu system as we go. All right, guys, so we're just going to go through the menu here. Now, I'm not going to go through every single option in here because it's just so unbelievable how many options there are. But I am going to go through all the stuff that I think matters and also some stuff that I think you should change. For starters here, on the left-hand side, we have shooting. So you can see here the menu tab is called shooting. And here's the different options. If you go over to the right, you now have the sub menu area and you can scroll through the sub menu. And then to get to individual items, you have to go over again to the right and you can get more items. So this is where a file format is. Now I want to show you this lens compensation here. If you go into lens compensation, I highly recommend turning all this stuff on if the camera will allow you to. Some lenses won't let you do focus breathing compensation, for example, and you may not want that anyway, but focus breathing comp is pretty awesome. And my 20 millimeter uh, G lens actually does support that, but I have the 16 to 35 millimeter older lens on here now. So I am going to do distortion comp. I'll set that to auto and I highly recommend turning that stuff on. It'll help with distortion and things like that. So if we go back over here and go down, now we have media. Now here are the media settings. So you can go in there and check that stuff out. This is where you can format the memory card. You can format card one, card two, and so forth. Now record media settings, I already showed you that. That's where those options are. Display media info. This will show you basically what is on the card, you know, how much stuff you have in there. Now if we just go back, we go down to file, we have write serial number. You can have the camera write the serial number of the camera to your files if you want. If we go back, shooting mode. These are the different shooting modes. Now flexible exposure mode, that's what it's currently set to. So I can change that if I want to this option here. Flexible is pretty much all of those modes in one. So if you want to make it a little bit more simplistic for video, you can change that to this. And now I can go up here to exposure mode and see how it says manual exposure. Now I can change that. So again, back to being beginner oriented. If you want the camera for video purposes and you want it to be a little easier to use, this is where you can go and change that. So I would recommend putting it in P mode if you're a beginner and the camera will do most of the thinking for you. Again, you do have power to change some stuff, but the camera will do a lot of the thinking for you in this mode. So I would probably set the ISO to auto and let the camera do all the work for you in that regard. Again, if you're new to the camera. But I'm going to switch that back to flexible exposure mode. And notice here, when you look at it, it's showing you what all the different dials do. And you can configure those dials in here to your liking. So if you want to make the back dial aperture as opposed to the front dial, for example, and so forth, you can make this wheel ISO if you'd rather have it that way. That's how I have my a7 IV set up. I'm just going to click OK. So again, I'll show you how that mode works in more detail in a moment. I just want to continue going through the menu first, OK? So now if we scroll down here, we have recall uh, camera settings, camera set memory. So this is where you can go and set the camera up to record whatever the camera settings are. So I can have the camera highly configured for log footage uh, with all different settings enabled. And you can go in here and this is where you can go and set it. So you can set it to one, two or three, and then that will correspond to those modes on the camera when you hit the mode dial. And uh, that's really how that works. And it's very powerful because if you use the camera inside a studio and you also use the camera, you know, outside, for example, you're going to have it configured completely differently. And changing all those individual settings is a huge pain in the ass. So this is where you would go and try to limit the amount of work that would be required when going from one environment to another. I'm just going to go back there. Now, memory recall media, this is where you can recall from the actual memory card. So you can save camera settings to the memory card and then put it in another camera. For example, if you have multiple FX30s or FX3s, whatever, you can, uh, you know, save that. So save those settings to the memory card and then swap the memory card for another camera and then load the camera with those settings really quick. So again, just a really fast way to get your workflow going, in particular, if you're working with a team of people or multiple camera units, you know what I'm saying? So if we scroll down more, we have silent mode. This is where the camera will eliminate all the beeping and stuff like that. If you don't want the camera to make any noise, release without lens, I would recommend leaving that enabled. Anti-flicker, this is where you can go to change the shutter speed to a variable amount. 
And this is great for flickering lights depending on what scene you're in. So if you see flickering going on, this is where you would go. So if I turn that on, so now you can see I can change the shutter speed. You can just dial it to whatever you want specifically. You see that? So that's how you can cancel out the flickering. Very powerful. And, you know, if you have flickering lights, you're in LED lights or, you know, those fluorescent lights, you might have to enable that. So I'm just going to continue to scroll down here. We have audio recording on and off. You got the level here you can go in here and you can change your level so you want to make sure that you're not clipping when you're recording audio let me keep scrolling down this is where you can set up your time code if you're using multiple cameras and you have them all synced up this is where you would go and enable that steady shot again this is set to standard but it also has an active steady shot mode so it will crop in just a little bit more and give you a digital stabilization in addition to any lens obstacle stabilization and the sensor stabilization. So by default, I recommend using standard, but if you need a little more, you can switch it to active and get a little bit more stabilization. If you're using a tripod though, you can have that turned off as well. Click menu here. If you're using fully manual lenses, you can set the focal length of that fully manual lens in here. But you can go in there and you could say like 85 millimeter or whatever if it's like a fully manual lens with no electronics. So just continuing to scroll down here, we have zoom range. Optical zoom only is what it's currently set to. But if I turn on clear image zoom, like so, watch this. Nope, I just got to change some settings here because it's a little uh, underexposed. So let me put that to 150th, right around there. All right, so check this out. Now if I zoom, that's clear image zoom right there. And you can see it right there on the top. There's like a bar that comes up and it'll show you the, the zoom. See that? So that's just clear image zoom. And clear image zoom works really good. It's a very high quality zoom. So you don't really see any degradation in the video when using it. It's a, it's a very nice feature and it's cool to be able to get a power zoom sort of effect when not using a power zoom lens. And you can get even more zoom with digital zoom, but digital zoom, definitely you could see the video quality is not as good. So I would not use that, but clear image zoom, I would check that out. That's worth using. Now zoom lever speed, you can change the speed at which the zoom happens. Incredibly powerful. And you have a lot of different options here. Custom configure it and stuff like that, which is amazing. Custom key zoom speed. And then remote zoom speed. So if you're using a remote, you can have a different speed than if you're using the zoom lever. And you can also have a different speed if you have a button set to zoom. So if you don't want to use the zoom lever and you want to use a button, you can do that as well. And then set the speed of that said button. So just crazy amount of power this camera has. Shooting display. This is where you can turn on the grid view. I recommend turning that on. I really like that. And you could see here, you could see the crosshairs now. And it's just easier to make sure that your camera is level and stuff like that. And you could use it as the rule of thirds guide as well. It's a nice feature. I recommend turning that on. Emphasized record display. This is that rectangle that goes on the screen. You could turn that off here if you don't want that. Marker display. This is more advanced stuff. If you want, if you have like different frame markers, you can enable that stuff here. Safety zones, aspect. And it's pretty cool because it'll give you like an idea of where those borders are. So when you're recording, you, you know to keep your camera in the correct framing. And that's what all this stuff is. Auto slow shutter. That's on. That's good. ISO. So in here, you can change the ISO range limit. So right now I have it set to as low and as high as it'll pretty much go. And that's where I have it. But you can dial that back if you don't want to go above like ISO 25,000, for example. You could set it like that. And now the camera, when using auto ISO, won't go above that. So you can set that there. Now when you're log shooting, this is where you can set the base ISO and stuff like that. And because this is like a video camera, basically, that also does photos, it has that in the menu. Now this is cool when in flexible, when in flexible exposure mode, you can make this stuff auto if you want. So I can change this to auto and uh, it makes it much easier to use the camera. See auto manual switch set. So like, again, if I'm using the camera like this, everything is fully manual. So I have to use the tri navi to control the exposure and stuff, but you can change that in the menu here if you want. 
All right, I'm gonna keep scrolling down. We have metering mode, spot metering. If you do choose spot metering, you can have that set to focus point link. I'm gonna enable that. So if you have that really tiny spot that you're exposing for, you can just have it set to this where it's, the camera is focusing, which makes a lot of sense because that's usually what you wanna do. Now white balance is where you can go in here and set your white balance and stuff like that. And you can also go in here and if you scroll down, you can set custom white balance. These are all your different white balance options. And then right here is custom white balance. So if I go over to the right, now I can hit the set button there, see that? So if I hit set, you could see that little box comes up and you could actually move the box around. So I'm gonna move the box to right there and I'm just gonna put this little gray card up. So now I have the gray card there and if you hit this little button here, so you see how it's showing you the circle? That's this button here, but you can just press the screen and it'll capture. So it just captured the white balance data. I'm gonna click OK. And now I have a custom white balance set. So now the scene is gonna be super accurate as far as color goes. So I always highly recommend custom white balancing and using custom white balance when applicable, especially inside a studio environment, because you never know, even though the lights might say they're 5,000, that doesn't mean they're actually 5,000. So, And that little gray chart, by the way, was like $8 on Amazon. I'll have that linked below for you guys if you're interested in that. So that's how you set custom white balance. Now, priority set, I just leave that at standard. This is the speed at which the white balance changes. I'm just gonna leave that at default. Now, if we continue to scroll down, dynamic range optimizer, you can have that on or off. I'm actually gonna turn that off. That just fills in the shadow detail a little bit. I prefer to do that type of stuff in post myself. Creative look is set to standard. Now, if you scroll down, you have all these different creative looks and this works for video as well. So you got vivid, all different options in here, black and white, sepia, and so forth. So if you're looking for something like neutral, for example, this is a good way to go if you want it to be a little bit flatter and not quite as punchy as default. But again, standard is where I'm going to leave it for now, and uh, it works pretty darn good. Now, picture profile, like PP11 is S Cinetone. So I recommend using that one if you're gonna try this out first for a picture profile. Now we got select LUT. You can actually load in a LUT onto the camera, which is incredible. And then you can manage your LUTs. So if you're shooting an S-Log3 and you normally apply a LUT in post-processing, you could now load the LUT onto the camera and you can get that preview, which is incredible that it has the ability to do that. So that's a nice feature that the FX30 has, and it makes sense because this is more of a video camera than a stills camera. Now, if we keep scrolling down, we have Zebra Display. Zebra Display is a great tool to use if you want to check exposure, and that's what I use it for. So if you turn it on like so, then you can set your zebra level. Now, if you go down here to C1, this is where you can go and customize it. So if you go over to the right, you can set the range. So if I had the camera set to S-Log3, I would want this at about 41% brightness, basically. And then I would set this to plus minus two. And then I can click the OK button. And so now the zebras are set for that exposure. So what we're gonna wanna see is the zebras on that gray chart. So right about there is the proper exposure for that gray card. So that's how you would use zebras to check exposure, just as an example. So that's how I do it anyway. I really like that zebra method with the 18% gray chart. It's so much easier to get your exposure nailed. And that's how I use it in the studio whenever I'm checking the exposure for my face and stuff like that. I just hold up the gray card. So if we scroll down here, we have focus mode. Now remember I was telling you how you can change the autofocus transition speed? This is where that option is. So right now it's set to fairly fast, but you can slow it down like so. Let me zoom in a little bit. So now if I hit record and I focus on the background here, it's going to go much slower than it did before. So watch when I go back to the face. You see how it's a much more cinematic, like slower transition? That's what transition speed does. So really like that feature. And depending on what you're doing, you can speed it up or slow it down. Now, the autofocus subject shift sensitivity, this is set to responsive. So that means it's really gonna shift pretty easily if you put something else in the scene. So locked on is gonna be less likely to change. So for example, if I'm recording video and it's focused on this face, 
right here, and then I put my hand in front of the face, if I have it on locked on, it's not going to change to my hand near as quick. If I have it set to responsive, it's going to instantly change to my hand. So watch what I'm watch what I mean here. Watch. If I hit record, and I'm recording, and I put my hand in front, let me cancel tracking. Goes to my hand, goes to the background, hand, background. All right. So now watch when I change. Let me just stop recording. Now if I go to menu and I change this to locked on, hit record. So now it's focused on the face and now watch when I put my hand in front. See how the dollar bill is staying sharp? Because it's not focusing on my hand. It's locked on the background. So it will eventually switch to my hand. I don't know how long it takes, but it takes a while. And that's what that feature does. So this is super helpful if you're recording something and occasionally your hands come into the scene. That's why you would use this feature. And that's what Locked On does. So I'm putting it on three because I want it like in between. All right, so this autofocus assist feature, what that does is it'll still use autofocus, but you can actually adjust the focus ring on the lens while recording video and the autofocus will change to whatever the focal plane is. It's similar to like that direct manual focus that I was showing you earlier if you're doing like macro photography. You remember how you like focused and then you can adjust the focus ring? This is kind of the same thing, but for video. Highly recommend checking that out and it has its use cases, you know? So focus area, I showed you that already. That just limits the area that the camera can focus. Focus area limit. These are all the different focus areas. Now you can uncheck the ones that you don't ever use if you want less options in the menu. That's what that means. Focus area color. I actually like red better than white. And I'll show you that. And let me show, let me change this focus area to zone again. And now you can see, you see how the zone brackets uh, are red. If I move this down a little bit, you can see them. So they're a little easier to see in, in, in some cases when they're set to red. So I like having that set to red. Now this is where you can select the right left eye. So you can program this to a button and then you can have it switch eyes if you want. So face eye frame display, I'm gonna turn that on cause I do like seeing that. That will just show a box around the face. Oh, there it is, see the box, that white box. So that white box will come up depending on the zoom range and stuff like that. Now you can see it's just a box. So that's what that is. I recommend having that on. It's helpful to see if it's seeing a face or not in the scene. Focus map, this is another way to manually focus. If you turn this on, uh, you could see this is what the screen looks like. And when you change the focus ring, if you're in manual focus, if I go to function, go to manual focus, now you can see how the focus map changes. And clear means that it's sharp. So you just gotta turn until right there. See how the face is clear? That's how you know you got the focus on the face when using manual focus. And that's what focus map does. Turn that off. Now focus magnify. This is so you can zoom in. You can see that little rectangle. And if you hit this button, it'll zoom in again. And it'll just help you manually focus. Again, another tool to help you manually focus. Let me just hit the uh, function button and put this back to autofocus continuous. All right, so scrolling through here. You can change the initial magnification to four times if you want, instead of one time. It's kind of helpful if you're just checking the eye for focus, for example. Focus magnify time, you can make that so it only lasts a couple of seconds and then it'll default back, which is kind of cool if you only want to see it for a minute. I like having it set to no limit though, for my purposes. Keep scrolling down, focus peaking. Let me show you what that looks like if we turn that on. It's set to middle and it's set to white, that'll work. So now, let me go back. I should have left it in, uh, yeah, I should have left it in manual focus. I'm just going to put it back to manual focus. So now you can see those white, see the white showing up on the dollar bills right here? That's focus peaking. So that's how you know the focus is right. Now you can see it showing up on the little face. And it's just, again, a visual indicator to show you where focus is. And it's very helpful when using manual focus. And you can change the color and the size of the peaking. So you could change it to red, uh, blue, yellow, as you can see here. 
a little easier to see, depending on what you're shooting, you know, if you're shooting yellow flowers. So this is just your playback area settings, enlarge image. So right here, enlarge initial position, I have that set to focus position. You got protect images, ratings, stuff like that. Can delete a photo. This is just letting you know if you want to delete by pressing twice, it'll automatically do that. You can turn this on and off so you don't have to constantly hit yes, I do want to delete. So it's just a confirmation there. Now here is a couple of features that you can, this is kind of like editing your photos in the camera. So you can rotate them, copy them. You can actually capture a photo. So this is where you would extract a photo from a video. So you would go into a video clip of yours that you want, you'd navigate to where you want, and then you can extract the photo from the actual video footage. That's what photo capture means. Now here you can just process the JPEGs back into HEIF if you want, or vice versa. And if we keep scrolling down here, this is for time-lapse interval shooting. So this is where you would play that back so you can actually preview what the time-lapse looks like, which is pretty sweet. Then you have slideshow. If you have this hooked up to a TV or something, for example, a large monitor, and you want to show your client some of the photos from the shoot, you can actually do slideshow, and it'll actually put the photos and videos to a slideshow for you, which is quite nice. Now, image index. This is just how many images you're going to see at once when you're scrolling through. So this is an option for grouping photos if you want. Display rotation that will automatically switch between landscape and vertical. Focus frame display. I'm going to turn this on. This will show you where the camera was focused when you're in the playback menu. So if I go into playback and I scroll to a photo, see right here that photo, you could see on the eye the green dot. It's hard to see because it's kind of small. But that's what that does. It tells you, it shows you in playback where you were focused. Great feature. So highly recommend turning that on. All right, so this is where you can go and just narrow your results down to specific time frame. If you have a really ton of images on a card for like a long period of time. Now image jump settings, you can just, how, when you turn the dials, how many images it'll go each time you turn the dial, for ex example. Now this is the network area. This is where you would go to, you know, connect to the smart device, your smartphone or your tablet, for example. This is where you would decide how to send the different photos. And uh, this is a really powerful area for that type of stuff. So I did do a video on the Imaging Edge app where I go over a bunch of this stuff. So be sure to check out that video if you wanna know more about this, cause it's pretty complicated. The app is a little finicky as well, but it does work and it will allow you to remote control the camera and stuff like that, which is really cool. And then of course you got FTP transfer, PC remote function. This is if you're controlling the camera from a computer via the USB-C cable, for example. It's pretty awesome. This is where you can turn Bluetooth on and off for the Bluetooth remote. USB streaming, this is where you can go and change the settings on that. And you can record if you want during the stream. You can turn that on and off there. You can change this to 4K for the best quality possible, but the frame rate does drop to 15 frames. So I would recommend doing HD at 30p probably for the most part, depending on what you're doing. Now, if we continue to scroll down here, we have some more network settings, Wi-Fi frequency band, display Wi-Fi, password, things like that. Bluetooth, we have that function turned on. Pairing, this is where you can go and you can add and delete things that have been paired to this. So if you have multiple smartphones that have connected to the camera, you can go in there and delete those, for example, if you get a new phone or whatever. Manage pair devices, that's where you would go to do that stuff. Display device address and so forth. This is where you can set your IP settings for the FTP type stuff. A little bit more advanced networking options. Now we have airplane mode. This is where you can turn that on and that will just save some battery life if you don't want any of the wireless features working like Bluetooth and stuff like that. You could either turn Bluetooth off or you can go in here and enable airplane mode if you like. You can edit the device name. Keep scrolling here. This is where you can select your language. I, we already set this up when we turned it in. Now this feature I wanted to show you, this is very important. This is where you select your video format type. Now see here how it says PAL versus NTSC. So PAL again is the European standard. So the frame rates are different. So again, when I went into the frame rates before, you saw 24 frames, 30 frames, 60 frames, 120 frames. 
PAL, you're going to get different numbers. You're going to get 25. Um, you're going to get 100 frames, for example, for slow motion. This is where you would go to change that. If you want my frame rates, you're going to want to have the camera set to NTSC. Now, setting reset, this is where you can go to initialize the camera, which is what I did when I started this video to make sure everything was set to factory. And save load settings. This is where you can go and you can load settings, which is awesome, like from a memory card, for example. Now, if we keep scrolling down, now we're in the setup area where you can customize the camera. So this is where you can customize the camera for photography. So these are all the different customizations. And as you can see, this camera is insanely customizable, super powerful, and it's for both photo and video. So you have separate custom customization for each mode independently, which is you know, just fantastic. Now function menu setting, this is where you can go and you can custom configure your function menus. You have one for photos and one for video, or you could just make them both the same, it's up to you. So again, super powerful and depending on your use cases, this is where you would go to set up the camera for your specific needs. Now different set for still and movie. This I highly recommend going in there and clicking OK and then selecting all these options. Now this will keep everything independent from photo and video. So if you switch the camera from photo mode, you're not gonna have to turn off picture profile and all that other crap. This will keep it independent between the modes. So highly recommend turning that on. Now your display screen, this is where you can go and customize that. You have four different screens. So when you hit this display button, it's gonna cycle through four times. You can disable some of these if you don't want them, and then it'll only cycle three times, for example if you were to turn one of them off. Now record with shutter, that's off. That's if you wanna use the shutter button as a record button, but there's a button on the top of the camera for that. I don't see any reason to change it. Now here's the custom key dial set. All right, so what it's showing you here is how you can change the dials. So you got these different dials and this is where you can go to configure that. And you can separate them in manual mode if you want um, with that checkbox. So I'm just gonna leave this stuff at default, but again, this camera is so highly customizable. And again, for photo and video, you have separate dial adjustments. So it, it, depending on how you like your Tri-Navi set up, this is where you would go to configure that stuff. My dial settings. So this is where you can go and you can set your dials up for specific purposes if you want to change them to something else. Now, AV TV rotate, this just means that depending on which way you turn the dial, the feature will go either up or down. You know, shutter speed will get faster or slower, for example, depending on how you have that set. Lock operation parts. This is where you can go and you can lock the camera down. So if you're handing the camera to somebody and they have no idea what they're doing and you don't want them changing settings, you can select all there and then hand them the camera and just tell them to hit the record button. And if they turn these dials by accident, nothing will happen. So that's what that feature is for. Touch operation, if you're somebody that does not want to use the touch operation, this is where you can go to turn that off. I like leaving it on. Now if you swipe up, it'll open the function menu. Touch function in shooting, so it's set to touch focus by default. That's because we're in video mode. When we're in photo mode, you can change that to touch tracking or touch shutter. Let me just switch modes here and show you that real quick. Put it in aperture priority mode menu. All right, so now I'm in aperture priority mode and I can change this. So watch, check out touch shutter. So touch shutter is cool because all you got to do is touch the screen and it'll just focus and take the shot, which is awesome. And now if notice that little button there. See that button? That's the touch shutter button. So if I press that, this button here, now it's off. If I press it again, now it's set to touch focus. So if I touch around, it's just going to focus where I touch. You have to actually touch the shutter for it to focus, but that's just moving the focus point around now is what it's doing. You could see there by that little icon. All right, so if you keep pressing it, now the icon is set to touch tracking. So now if I touch, it's tracking. You see the box? It's a different style box. So anyways, you can just touch that button on the top to cycle through the different features. Now it's back to touch shutter. So you can see how that icon changes. But if you go in the menu, this is where that option is. It's kind of, you might not know what those icons mean, but you can change it in here as well. So I'm just gonna set it to touch focus for now. Now, if we continue to scroll down, we have screen reader. This is for people that are visually impaired. You can turn this on and it'll actually read the screen for you, which is super helpful if you're, again, visually impaired, you know? 
Now monitor brightness, I want to go in here and show you this because if it's really bright outside, you're going to want to make this brighter. And if you just click on this, you can switch it to sunny weather mode. Sunny weather mode will make the screen super bright and it's way easier to see when you're outside in, you know, sunny weather. But manual is also cool. I have it at plus one right now just because I'm recording. I like the screen just a little brighter for when I'm in the studio here recording. Now if I scroll down, you have display quality. I recommend putting that on high. Monitor flip direction. You can actually change the way that it flips, which is pretty cool. A lot of times people will ask for how do you set this up when you're doing it in selfie mode. I want it to look like a mirror or I don't want it to look like a mirror. That's where this option comes into play. Now, if we continue to scroll down, we have more stuff here. We got time code and user bit display settings, gamma display assist. This is a feature that you would want to use if using log footage. It'll give you a more accurate looking exposure on the screen for you, basically, is what that does. And you can have it set to auto and it'll, depending on what log mode you're using, it'll automatically adjust for you. Auto review for photos. What this means is when you take a photo, it'll show you the image for like two seconds and you can change the timer and then it'll go away and you'll get back to seeing what you normally see. So you can take more photos. I like having that off by default, but if you're one of those people that takes a photo and you want to look at the photo, like immediately, I would turn that on. Power save start time. This is a really good feature. I would recommend setting this to like a minute or two, depending on your use cases. I had it set to off. So if I just walked away from the camera, it would just stay on until it, the battery was dead. So two minutes is usually pretty good, depending on what you're doing. Auto power off temp. When I first turned the camera on, uh, we enabled that already, but that's where that option is. And click OK again. And I was going to keep scrolling down. You have the volume settings, four channel audio monitoring, audio signals. That's the beeping. Like when you focus, you can turn that off right here. USB connection mode. You can set this to a specific mode if you want, or you can select when you plug into a USB cable. So if you're hooking up to a computer or whatever the case may be, that's where that option is. USB power, you're definitely going to want that on. HDMI resolution, you might have to mess with this stuff if you're hooking up the camera to an external monitor. Sometimes TVs don't automatically know what resolution and stuff like that, so you might have to hard set some of this stuff, but that's where those options are. And this is where you can turn the info display on or off. So if you have the info display set to on, all the camera data, like all this stuff, all these icons will appear on the monitor. So that's what this feature does. The downside to having that on is this monitor will go off if you do that. Now, if you keep scrolling down, you got a power link option for video light modes. Now record lamps, these are the tally lights. Now you can turn that stuff on or off. You see that? You could only have the front one off if you want, or you can turn them all off. Very, very nice feature. I'm just going to leave them on because I like that. Fan control, you could turn that on or off. I just like leaving it in auto. Sensor cleaning, this is where you can go and it'll try to get the dust off for you. You can do pixel mapping as well. Now version, if you go in here, this will tell you what the camera's current version is. So the FX30 is currently at version 1.0 on the camera that I got here. Let's click OK. And that is pretty much it. So we're back to the My Menu area. So let me just add an item in here and show you how that works really quick. So if you go to Add Item, and again, we're on the top left, My Menu. So if we go in here and we scroll through, let's say I want Log Shooting setting, and I'm going to put it in My Menu 1, adds to this location, Added. There we have it. So now if I go back into the menu here, and we go all the way to the left, we have my menu one, see that? And now look on the right hand side, we have log shooting. So that's how you would add items to the my menu. And again, if you wanna add more items, just go down and go over to add item. See that? So you just go to add item. And this is where you can go to sort them, delete them, delete a page. All right, so let me show you how that flexible mode works a little bit better when recording video. So if I go into mode and I'm gonna put it back into video mode right here, all right, so I want to change the white balance. So there's a button on the top of the camera and it says WB, it's button number two. And I'm going to go to my custom here because I want to custom set this. Remember how we did that before? Set that right there. There we go. So now I got that custom configured and you can see it's actually 42K, 4200 K is the actual color temperature. So now I got that custom configured and because we have independent settings for both photo and video, 
that's why that didn't stay as was set in photo mode, okay? Remember when we checked all those boxes? All right, so depending on what we want to do here when recording video, basically what we need is an accurate exposure. So we're going to want that meter there to be near the zero mark for the most part, depending on what you're doing. So notice here, if I start dialing up the ISO, the image is becoming way overexposed. So let's say I put it at ISO 5000, right? So the image is way overexposed. So the only way to compensate for that is by changing the shutter speed or the aperture. But we're recording video, so we don't really want to change the shutter speed. We want that at 1 50th. So I can change the aperture though, like so. So F14 will get us an accurate like exposure in this scenario. But don't forget, ultimately what you're really gonna to wanna to use is the base ISOs when recording video in S-Log. But if you're not using S-Log and you're using regular video like we're doing here, you can manipulate these settings and you're still gonna get good results. But again, best use case, you're gonna to wanna to use log footage and have those base ISOs hard set. But this is how you would adjust the exposure if you're just using it as a regular camera or if you're using S Cinetone, for example. So now I have the ISO at 100 and you can see the camera's way underexposed. So I'm gonna to need to open up that aperture to let more light in. And F4 is as fast as this lens is. That's the max aperture for this lens. So the only other option now is to turn up the ISO a little bit. So I'm gonna to have to bring it up. Now the meter is back at zero and I have a proper exposure. So that's just very basic how that works. And then again, I can just record video and now we're recording. Zoom in and out while recording video, no problem, and so forth. So let me just change the mode into photography mode and I'm gonna show you just how these modes work a little bit in more detail for those newer to photography and video. So if I set the camera up, to aperture priority mode, for example. If I turn, the aperture is that F number there. So if I turn the front dial here, that's gonna change the aperture. And the aperture is basically like the pupil of your eye. It gets smaller and larger as the aperture opens and closes. So F4 right now for this lens is wide open. Now if I stop that aperture down by turning it to a higher number like F18, now the aperture is like a tiny little hole. So that's what's changing. So at the higher numbers though, we have a larger depth of field. So notice when you're looking at the face, how the background actually looks fairly sharp now. That's because the depth of field is really large. So now if I lower the aperture to F4 and focus on the face, now you can see the background looks blurry. You see how those bouquet balls are for the Christmas lights I have hanging? So that's depth of field. So if you wanna get that blurry background, you really wanna have a fast aperture lens. Now this is an F4 lens. So it's not the fastest lens, but let me show you what I mean. Hang on one second, let me change this out. So now I have my 20 millimeter F1.8 lens there. And now if I open the aperture up, look, now it goes all the way to F1.8, you see that? So now I have an f1.8 aperture, so the background's going to potentially be even blurrier and it'll be better for low light situations because I can have a lower ISO. So again, if I want the shutter at 1 50th of a second, right there, see how the ISO is only at 64? So to get cleaner images, you're gonna to wanna to use a faster aperture lens in lower light situations. So there's a huge difference between F4 and F1.8. You could see here, right there, so the, the shutter speed went all the way down to one-tenth of a second to get a proper exposure at F4. So that's what aperture does. So notice when I change the aperture, how the shutter speed is automatically changing. Pretty interesting, right? So if we go in here to ISO and we change it to auto ISO, now I have the ISO set to auto and notice what happens when I change the aperture. See how the shutter speed isn't changing as much? It is changing, but notice how it's not going below 1 40th of a second. Instead, the ISO is going up. If I press the shutter down, you can see it's at ISO 4000 now. And if I lower it to like F7, you can see it's at ISO 1000 now. And if I keep going down, the shutter speed will eventually get faster. So now it's at ISO 100. So now it's at 1 40th, but it won't go any slower. So 1 50th is the fastest it'll go. So again, if I change the ISO, if I go into the function menu and set the ISO to like say 100, like so, 
Now, if I change the aperture, see how the shutter speed is changing? So now the shutter speed, the shutter has to be open for two full seconds in order to get a proper exposure. So that's what aperture priority mode does. It basically allows you to change the aperture. And if you have it set to auto ISO or hard set to ISO, that will depend if the shutter speed changes or not. So let me change the mode now to shutter priority mode. All right, so now if I turn this dial on the back, you can see how the shutter is changing and notice how the aperture is changing automatically. Right now it's blinking because it's underexposed. But watch when I make the shutter speed, see that? The aperture is automatically changing because it's trying to keep the exposure correct based on the fact that the ISO is set to 100. So if I go into the function menu, change the ISO to auto, and now I change the shutter speed. The aperture, see how the aperture is at f1.8 right there? So now notice how the camera is not underexposing because I have it set to auto ISO. Now the ISO is at 320. So I can put the shutter up to like 1 500th of a second, right? It's at ISO 640 now, as you can see. So what's cool about shutter speed is you can basically control the amount of time that the shutter is open. So if you want motion blur or you want to freeze action, that's where it comes into play. So for example, let me show the slow the shutter down to a third of a second. Let me just turn this a little bit right there. Should still be able to see that okay. All right, so now watch what happens if I spin this and take a photo. And I go to the playback menu. You could see, look at the motion blur. Because that fan spun around multiple times within that one third of a second exposure. All right, so I got the ISO and auto, and I'm just going to raise up the shutter speed to one five hundredth of a second, for example. So now watch. So at one five hundredth of a second, it froze the action, as you can see there. Now, this doesn't have a mechanical shutter in there, so you will get a little bit of distortion with, with stuff spinning like that. But you could see how the faster shutter speed froze the action, and that was the point that I'm trying to illustrate here. That's what shutter priority mode is for. It allows you to just control the shutter speed, and the camera will handle the other settings for you. You can hard set the ISO if you want, but if you leave it in auto, the camera will then automatically adjust. So now, if we go into full manual mode, like so, this is the M, full manual mode. Now we have full control, but you can still use auto ISO. So if I turn this dial, it's gonna turn the ISO, so it's on auto, but you can change it if you want. I'm just gonna leave it on auto for a second. This front dial here is changing the aperture. See that? And this rear dial is changing the shutter speed. I'm gonna take the ISO off auto, I'm gonna put it on ISO 100 like that. And now you can see that the camera is underexposed because the meter here is blinking. It's at negative two. It's probably more than negative two. So now what I can do is I can change the shutter speed. So if I lower the shutter speed, I'm allowing more time for the light to come in. And if you just look at the meter, right there, 1 60th of a second, looks like a proper exposure at f1.8 ISO 100. So now, let's say that I want more sharpness, like I want the background to be sharper. Because right now, remember, we're at f1.8, so the background's looking a little blurry because I'm focused on the face here. So if I want the background sharper, I could just focus on the background, but if I want the foreground and the background sharper, I need to increase the aperture, and that will increase the depth of field. So let's say I want f5.6. So you could see here, it's way underexposed. So I have two options. I could slow down the shutter speed, and that'll allow more time for the light to come in. See that? So that's a proper exposure, but the shutter speed is really slow at one sixth of a second. So if there's motion in the scene, that's not gonna be good. If I'm hand holding the camera, that's not gonna be good either. If you're using a tripod though and self timer, then one sixth of a second is no problem. But check this out. Let's say I need the shutter speed to be one sixtieth of a second because I'm hand holding. So the only option now is to raise the ISO. So if I raise the ISO, and watch the meter right there. So we're looking at ISO 800. So 1 60th of a second, F5.6, ISO 800 is a proper exposure 
for this scene. So again, the two other factors that matter are if you want to capture motion or not, or if you want motion blur, that will control what you want the shutter speed to be at. The other thing that matters is depth of field with the aperture. So depending on how close you are to your subjects and how blurry you want the background, you're going to want to manipulate the aperture there, as well as for low light. The larger the aperture, the more light is going to be able to come in, which will allow for a lower ISO, right? Because right now it's at 5.6. So watch what happens. If I want more light to come in, I open up the aperture. You see how the screen's getting brighter? That's because more light can come in in that given period of time because the aperture is larger. So now, because I have a fast f1.8 lens, I could lower the ISO to get a cleaner image, right? The lower the ISO, the cleaner the image. So right there. So that's one of the huge advantages of using a fast aperture lens. Now I'm at ISO 100. So that's pretty much how that works. So now if I go to mode and I go into video mode, flexible video mode, that works the same way as manual mode that I was just showing you. So if you press the ISO button on the top of the camera, you can actually turn it into auto or turn it off by holding the ISO button down. So see now it's ISO auto. And now if I hold the button again, now it's back to manual. So that's how you can actually change that, which is kind of cool. But again, if you go into the menu, you can turn that stuff on and off right here. So you can put the camera into aperture priority mode basically by putting these two in auto. If you want the camera in shutter priority mode, you would put the bottom one in auto and the top one in auto, for example. But as it stands now, we're in full manual mode recording video. So those things that I was telling you about earlier all apply. So I have it in manual focus. Let's put it in auto focus continuous. Go to focus area, do wide. All right, so there we are, recording video. I have it set up, so I want the shutter speed. I'm gonna want the shutter speed at 1 50th of a second because I'm recording in 4K at 24P, so I am gonna to wanna to double that frame rate. So 1 50th of a second, I'm gonna change the aperture to f1.8 like so. That's looking pretty darn good. It's slightly overexposed, but we're okay. We can just chop that just a little bit if we want. There we go. Now we can hit record. Now when recording video, you can still change options. So I can still change the aperture. See how I'm changing that while it's recording? So you can do that just so you're aware. And there we have it. So that pretty much about covers the Sony FX30 from a crash course perspective, beginner's guide how to use the camera. I really hope that you got what you were looking for in this video. It's a very powerful camera. I mean, it's extremely powerful. I have a lot of videos on the FX3 as well, so you can watch those tutorials. I also have tutorials on the Imaging Edge app, like I mentioned earlier. And of course, below the video, guys, I'll have all the links that I was talking about in the video, such as memory cards, tripods, and other accessories you might be interested in. So if you have any questions, please be sure to ask below in the uh, comments area, and I'll be glad to get back to you. All right, I'll catch up with you guys later. Have a great day. Take care.